Dr. Tyrone Hayes was uh, born in Columbia, South Carolina, where as a child he became fascinated with uh, the wildlife around him and particularly amphibians. He went to Harvard University where he earned a degree in evolutionary biology. He later received a PhD in integrative biology from the University of California, Berkeley, where he then became an associate professor. At the age of 32, he became the youngest tenured professor in the department's history and was named a full professor three years later. Dr. Hayes has published dozens of peer-reviewed papers on the topic of the effects of pesticides on amphibian growth, development, and reproduction. He came to prominence beyond the field of integrative biology when his research indicated that the most heavily used pet, uh, herbicide in the United States, atrazine, caused sexual malformation in frogs that were exposed to doses as low as 0.1 part per billion, 30 times below the federally established so-called safe limit for atrazine in human drinking water. The uh, great Mississippi riverboat pilot Mark Twain once said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Well, friends, the truth has got its boots laced up and just walked into the room. Please welcome Dr. Tyrone Hayes. I want to start, if you've ever seen me speak, you know that I, I sort of work backwards. I start with the acknowledgments and thank yous. And, and my first, I want to thank Mike and Whitney for chasing me down while I was in other places and, and for organizing this. And again, all of you for coming out. And then in my next, my next acknowledgment before I, before I tell you all about atrazine and stuff, really goes to my mother. And, and this is not my mother, obviously. <laughs> She's much, much better looking than that. But, but this is a tribute to my mother. This is Jamie Foxx. He's kind of a popular, famous, famous actor these days. And this is the cover of New York Times Style magazine. And it, and it came to a friend of ours' house one, one weekend. And when you opened it up, there was an article called Sip of the Iceberg. It was actually a wine review. And the article reads... There was a huge controversy several years ago in the science world when an endocrinologist discovered that exposure to a common weed killer atrazine caused male frogs to develop female sex organs. It goes on. Men who want to explore the rarefied milieu of ice wines need not work. So the article had nothing to do. <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll tell you why it's a tribute to my mom. So in, in academia, in the ivory tower, we, we get tenure for doing things like publishing in the, in the really big journals, like Nature and Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences. And when I got my first papers published in those top journals, I remember I still call my mom every Sunday. In fact, I called her before, from the airport here. I called my mom and I said, I just got two big papers published. And she said, well, you publish papers all the time. What's the big deal? I said, it's Nature. It's PNAS. You don't understand. These are the most important papers in my career, my atrazine papers. So the next week, she calls me back and she says, son, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but how important are those papers? She said, I went to Barnes & Noble, and they never heard of those magazines. <laughs> and, and it then struck me, it struck me as, you know, that here we are measuring ourselves by things that mean nothing to 99.999% of the world. I'm calling my favorite publication, and it's in a magazine that my mom can't go buy, that the public doesn't have access to. So my next acknowledgement is to uh, my... This beautiful woman is my wife, Catherine Kim, and my son, Tyler Casey Kim Hayes, and my daughter, Cassina Simone Kim Hayes. I want to thank and acknowledge, as well as disclose, all of my funding sources. I have been funded by Novartis Syngenta, the company that makes atrazine, and as well as by another other government, and not, yeah, but they don't want to play with me anymore, <laughs> as well as a number of other government and non-government organizations. And then I want to thank all of the students that have been involved in the works over the last 10 years. And finally, my, to my grandmother, who passed away just after dinner last Christmas on Christmas Day. It was her goal in life to make the world a better place through education. And I want to make sure that that goal didn't pass with her. And now I'd like to talk to you about frogs. This is a leopard frog. You're going you're gonna to hear a little bit about a leopard frog in a minute. In fact, that one was photographed in Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken. What fascinated me as a child about frogs and continues to fascinate me is the accessibility. So for example, you're looking at an egg that's really about the size of a pinhead. It's blown up here under the microscope. It's been fertilized, so you can see it's becoming a multicellular organism. In a few hours, it'll look like this. Here's a few more hours. After a few more hours, each one of these little dimples is a cell. This is developed from a single 
cell. Then they go through gastrulation and neurulation, where they form their brain and nervous system, just like we do. And, and that's important that I say that, because it's not that it's doing anything magical. We develop exactly the same way. It's just that as a child, because there's no eggshell, because it's not inside mom, I had access and could watch these organisms developing literally in my backyard. What is unique and fascinating to amphibians, though, is that they have a, a little something extra in their development. Here's a tadpole. So it's now, this started from a single cell. It hasn't eaten anything yet. And it's a completely functioning, swimming, breathing organism at hatching. But then it goes through this transformation, this metamorphosis, if you will, where there are things that are obvious to all of us that were obvious to me as a kid, like the tail goes away and it grows legs and the gills go away and it grows lungs. But what you may not realize is that every aspect of this organism transforms. The hemoglobin changes, all the cell surface proteins change, literally all the genes that it takes to make a tadpole get turned off and a whole new set of genes to build a frog get turned, gets turned on. It's like two organisms in one. And what's important, and, and the reason I wanted you to go through this development with me is, all these genes that are being turned on and off, they're being turned on and off by hormonal cues. Thyroid hormone, testosterone, estrogen. And what's important for you to know is that these hormones are chemically identical to our hormones. The exact same estrogen that I'm going to talk to you about that regulates female development in these frogs is the exact same estrogen that regulates the menstrual periods of every woman in this room. The hormones are exactly the same. And so, in the same way that I had access to this organism, there was no eggshell, no placenta, no amniotic membrane. Chemicals in the water that interfere with these hormones similarly have access to these organisms. And once these chemicals create hormonal imbalances, which I'll talk about, then we have problems that are predictive of problems that I think we as humans will also face. So I was studying this aspect of how the environment can influence frogs when, when a little company called Novartis came to me and asked, we'd like for you to put some atrazine into some of your experiments. I had no idea what atrazine was. And now I can't, see me. I can't Google atrazine without my name coming up now. <laughs> here's, here's what it looks like if you care. It's, it's an herbicide or a weed killer. And just by way of definition, when I use the word pesticide in my talk, I'll mean anything that kills a pest. So insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, they're all pesticides. Atrazine is specifically, specifically an herbicide or a weed killer. It's been used for 48 years, so it's been around for, for quite some time. And we use 80 million pounds annually in the United States, primarily in corn. <laughs> we use 80 million pounds annually in the United States, and up until recently, now displaced by glyphosate, it was the number one selling pesticide in the world. Now it's number two, but it's not because we use less atrazine, it's because we also use now just as much Roundup. It's used in more than 80 countries, so it's quite widespread around the world, and it's now outlawed in all of Europe. And I have to give you a disclaimer. Syngenta comes to my talks a lot, Novartis, and they like to write me little legal-sounding notes. And so they want me to point out that atrazine has not been banned in Europe. This is not true. It has been denied regulatory approval. So <laughs> for whatever legal difference that makes, if it, if it keeps me out of the courtroom, I've now told you the correct thing. The reason I point this out, though, is as you might know, Novartis, Syngenta, is a European-based company. It's based out of Switzerland. So here we have a compound that's illegal in the country where the company is housed, is home to, but we're using 80 million pounds a year. I also usually like to point out to people, one of the other countries where atrazine is illegal is Angola. You know, it's in Southwest Africa. Angola has the longest standing civil war in all of Africa. They'd be the richest country in the world. They have gold, oil, and diamonds, but they can't manage it because of the civil war but they know they don't want atrazine. <laughs> I, I, I think that's something, worth, that's something worth thinking about. So what I'm going to do now is go through some of the work that, that led me to, to come, come to odds with the company. We, did a, we used a laboratory model to examine the effects of atrazine on their internal organs. And so you're looking at a kidney and gonads dissected from an African clawed frog, not the species I showed you earlier. And what's peculiar about this animal is it has two testes there, the two round balls there, then it has two ovaries, then it has a large testis, and then it has more ovaries. So it is a true child of Hermes and Aphrodite, a true hermaphrodite. And that's not normal. <laughs> and I always have to point that out because anytime I give this talk, somebody always asks, aren't frogs naturally hermaphroditic? 
And, and why do people think that? Somebody always knows. Jurassic Park, exactly. It took me years to figure out why people... In Jurassic Park, frog DNA caused the dinosaurs to change sex, but that's science fiction. It, it happens in fish, sometimes naturally. It is not a natural pattern for, for frog development. Here's a reason that atrazine causes this problem in frogs. It causes a hormonal imbalance, if you will. So imagine that this is your testis, or as I usually point out, imagine a friend's testis if you're not so in doubt. But <laughs> always ask first. Don't go blaming that on me. Your, your testis should make testosterone, which literally means hormone of the testis, and, and that's what makes you masculine if you're a male. What atrazine does is atrazine turns on an enzyme. It turns on the machinery, if you will, that's responsible for converting testosterone into the female hormone, estrogen, which literally means the generator of estrus. And so when that happens, if you're a frog, you become demasculinized or chemically castrated and subsequently feminized because now you're making the female hormone when you should not be if you're, if you're a male. And that's it's what results in the development of ovaries in these males. The next thing we decided to do, though, because that was one laboratory model looking at one species, is we decided to take this laboratory model and do comparative studies to ask, do we see effects across species? We looked at the leopard frog, which is the frog I showed you developing in the beginning. It's a North American frog. And showed that here's a male's testis. They have two, just like we do. But all this, as I usually tell my young audiences, all this junk in the trunk, these are all eggs developing in this male's testis. This was that famous paper that I called my mom about that we published in Nature. These are eggs. This male has gotten confused and started growing eggs in his testis and now bursting through the surface of its testis. Now, when the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, looked at these data, they finally decided that they were statistically significant and biologically significant, but they were unclear as to whether or not it was an adverse effect. <laughs> hmm. And here's where I usually, right guys, a dozen chicken eggs in your testicle, popping out of it. I don't know. I'm no regulator. <laughs> the next thing we decided to do was we, we decided to ask, we had all these laboratory studies suggesting there was a problem, but is it a problem in the real world? What I want to impress upon you, because there's a bill coming up about what the level should be in, in your drinking water, for example, in your surface water. We saw these effects that I've just showed you, these dramatic effects of 0.1 parts per billion. Now, as a visual person myself, I know that that doesn't mean anything to you. You can't see 0.1 micrograms per liter is what that means. So, so here's a visual. Imagine a grain of salt. And now divide the weight of that grain of salt by 1,000. That's 0.1 micrograms per liter. One one-thousandth of a grain of salt in a, in a four-liter aquarium. So it, sound, it sounds like nothing. If you look at the package of atrazine, it's recommended it be applied at 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. So people are applying it at 20, 290 million times what it takes to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frogs. We went through the literature and looked at the minimum and maximum detected in studies looking at agricultural runoff, temporary water, permanent water, and precipitation. In fact, I learned here in Minnesota that a half million pounds of atrazine come down in the rainwater every year. You, can, you have atrazine in your rainwater in Minnesota from when they apply it in Kansas. That's how far it travels. Here's the level that it takes to make hermaphroditic frog, 0.1 parts per billion. And here's where I usually remind people, anytime you see red in one of my slides, you don't have to think about it. Red means bad. Now, if you see a red graph or red bar, red line, you know it's the bad thing. Here are all the waters that would be impacted. Here's all the waters that carry enough atrazine to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frogs. There's enough atrazine in rainwater to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frogs. And, and, and you want to see now why the EPA doesn't like me. They have a, their own I Hate Tyrone website, even. <laughs> um, here's what the EPA says is safe for you to be exposed to, and here's what the EPA says is safe in your drinking water. Because nobody ever tested 0.1 parts per billion. Three parts per billion is safe in your drinking water because atrazine causes tumors in rats above 3,000 parts per billion. So they divide it by 10 because they only tested one strain of rat, and other strains might be more sensitive. They divide it by 10 because they only tested one species, the rat, and then they divide it by another 10 because, well, there might be something that they don't know. Nobody ever tested three parts per billion. That's like if I shot you with a big bazooka armor-piercing missile and then said, well, you know, handguns are safe because they're smaller. That's how that standard was decided for your drinking water. Here's what happens when we look at frogs from the field. Here's the kidneys. These are the testes. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a histological cross-section now. So imagine I'm taking a really thin slice of a salami. I'm going to fold that slice out. 
I'm going to blow it up under the microscope, and I'm going to blow that section up. What you see in these animals from the wild are, here are the testicular tubules, just like we have guys. Here are the nurse cells or the sertoli cells, except instead of nursing sperm, each one of these tubules has an egg in it. So these are males in the wild that are growing eggs in their testes. And in fact, we know that this is happening from the Mississippi River in Minnesota as well. This is the first study that we published. Again, the red areas showing the areas of highest atrazine use down to the gray-white. And now what we've done in, in, in conjunction with the USGS, if we've done one of the largest studies ever to look at frogs all across the United States and correlate deformities such as the ones I've shown you with pesticide exposure. And that work is, is ongoing and hopefully soon to be published. And now for some work that I just published a couple of months ago, and the last piece that I'll talk about of my own work, my own published work anyway, is we've had these laboratory studies that were controlled but not real because they're in the lab. Then we had this real study that was real, but we have no control over when and how the frogs are exposed. So we did something sort of in between. We, we sort of took the CSI approach. <laughs> you know, it's the only television show I watch, and as I point out, I think it's a pretty good show, but it's also because it's apparently on every night of the week on every channel, so I don't have to remember. <laughs> I know, when I go to the hotel tonight, I'll be able to watch CSI. But what I learned from CSI is, is to take the CSI approach. Because you can get something in the lab, really great experiment, but then when you go to your crime scene, so we rope ours off, our frog pond's right about there in the middle of this cornfield in Nebraska. When you go to the crime scene, there's lots of suspects. It's not like the lab, right? So there's all these herbicides, these fungicides, and these insecticides. And so we conducted a study to ask, what happens when you mix all of these things together compared to when you look at them individually? Because no frog, or no human for that matter, is ever exposed to a single compound. So we did that experiment. Now you see why there's so many undergraduates involved. And just, just real brief, we looked at controls, so they were treated with no pesticides. This two-compound mixture, atrazine and metolachlor, because these are the two persistent herbicides, and the full mixture of nine compounds. And then we looked at the average time to metamorphosis. So you can imagine this as being like your birth date, the date that you're going to give birth to your baby. So what this says is, even though no one pesticide had any effect, the, when you mix the pesticides together, you delayed metamorphosis. It's the equivalent of making you go over your due date, if you're pregnant, if you will. And, and it, was, it was interesting because, again, no one compound had that effect. And it was also interesting because the EPA, of course, when they finally acknowledged the data, said, yeah, it's statistically significant, but is it biologically significant? The next thing we did is we looked at this relationship. And it, it might look a little complicated, but I'll show you what it is. So again, it's the controls, the two-compound mixture, and the full nine-compound mixture. And what this is showing you is that if you look at time to metamorphosis, compared to body weight, this is showing you that the tadpoles grow. The longer they take the metamorphose, the bigger they are. Again, think of it like pregnancy. The longer you're pregnant, the bigger the baby's going to be. That's what a doctor doesn't want you to go overdo, right? If you're exposed to these two compound mixtures, you get the reverse effect, and you get a severely reverse effect when you expose them to all nine compounds. They take longer to metamorphose, and they're smaller when they finally come out. That's, that should tell you, if we were talking about humans, that'll tell you that your womb, your amniotic fluid, is not a very nourishing place. And that's exactly what it's telling us in these tadpole studies. What's more important is, if you look at the individual compounds we studied, none of them have a negative relationship. So there's no way you can predict this effect by looking at these individual compounds, which is how we do all of our assessment of pesticides in this country and elsewhere, as far as I know. Nobody looks at mixtures, which is crazy when you think about it. The doctor would never give you a pharmaceutical without checking what other medication you're on. But we're constantly exposed to a mixture of compounds where we have no idea what they call in the pharmacy industry what the contraindicative effects are when you mix them together. Of course, the EPA asks, is it biologically significant? And yeah. If you come out small, it's hard for you to find food if you don't chew. And if you come out small, it's easy for you to be food. So these animals are not only taking long time to metamorphose, but they're coming out at a disadvantage in terms of being involved in their predator-prey relationships. The other thing we found is that if you look at controls, compared to the animals exposed to the mixture, 70% of the animals exposed to the mixture look like this. They have flavobacterial meningitis, caused by a pathogen that's present in these animals, but they don't get sick. These animals have been immune-suppressed. 
When we look at the thymus under the microscope, which is where your T cells come from, they have the same structure we do. This is a healthy thymus. These thymi, thymi thymuses, I don't know what the plural is, these have holes in them. So they're immune suppressed and unable to fight off otherwise fairly benign pathogens, fairly benign germs. It turns out that I had done my graduate work looking at stress hormones and how the stress hormones affect immunosuppression, decreased growth, and retarded development. The same suite of characters we were seeing with this pesticide exposure. So we hypothesized in this latest paper that pesticides were just acting as stressors. You're hit with one, you hit with more, see the arrow gets bigger, it's a more and more stressful event. And we hypothesize that that's why you don't see this effect with one chemical, only when you see when you're exposed to the multiple chemicals. We measured blood levels of corticosterone, that's the frog stress hormone, we make the same hormone. And indeed, pesticide exposed animals have five times more stress hormone, if you will, than unexposed animals. What's more is, we went back into our laboratory, our field collections, and started to ask something about the disease rates of animals that we had collected from agricultural areas in the field. So for example, here's a leopard frog, there's a liver. If you look at that under the microscope, it's one of my favorite slides because that looks like a smiley face wearing sunglasses. <laughs> so, that wasn't a perfect, imagine I'm, one Sunday morning I look under the microscope and his liver is smiling back at me. <laughs> Actually what it is, what these are, these are slices, you know, we slice this to look at it. These are cestode worms that have filled this liver, 90% of the liver is filled with parasites. This isn't from the lab, this is an animal from the field. Here's a section through kidneys, so here's some kidney tubules. All the rest of these two kidneys are filled with trematode worms. Here's why this is significant. There are interacting factors that might be not human induced. So for example, temperature goes up, the pond dries up, the animals become more crowded, and you get a stress response. Or global warming, moving water for agricultural purposes, draining wetlands, some of them probably have human impacts. But nevertheless, environmental factors can interact and cause a natural stress, if you will. That there's an interaction whereby when the pond dries up, the pesticides become more concentrated. So there's an interaction between these other environmental factors. And then once you're stressed and mobilized fat, your fat-soluble pesticides join your water-soluble pesticides from the outside, leading to a really big stress response. The result is immunosuppression, like we see in the laboratory, which can lead to diseases that otherwise wouldn't do much to the animals at all. And it also lead to higher parasite loads. Here's what's sinister about the whole program, two things. One is these interactions feed on themselves because once you become immunosuppressed and your liver and kidney get damaged by parasites, what happens then? If you get poisoned, what are the two most important organs in your body? What do alcoholics die of? Liver and kidney damage, right? So if by being exposed to pesticides, you become immunosuppressed and so you get kidney and liver damage, then you can't get rid of the pesticides. You effectively increase your internal load even more. And the, the ultimately sinister part of this all is, if I'm an ecologist trying to study amphibian declines, when I go out into the field, I don't see pesticide poison dead animals. I see frogs that didn't metamorphose in time because the pond dried up. I see frogs that couldn't find enough food. I see frogs that were too often food. I see frogs that got a disease. I don't see, unless I had the laboratory data, the real role, the central role that pesticides are playing in amphibian declines. You might also know, of course, it's Minnesota, so of course you know about the limb deformities in frogs that are contributing to their declines. And we now know that it's not so much the pesticides that cause the limb deformities, but a guy named Joe Kiesiger has shown that pesticides cause immune suppression, and so the parasites that cause the limb deformities have more access to the animals. So again, atrazine doesn't cause limb deformities directly, but it lowers immune function, and then these animals get these parasites that have been around forever. You're only seeing more limb deformities now because they can't fight off the parasites the way that they used to. The last part of this puzzle is, because we started in the lab, we went to the field, we came back to the lab, how do we really bring the, the field back in the lab? And, and this is ongoing work that I, that I won't tell you much about. But we actually collected thousands of gallons of water, dating all the way back to 2001, from rivers that produced hermaphrodites and rivers that, that didn't. And we also, in different years, collected sometimes water from the same river that was not contaminated. In, in, in other years. And so now we can literally take river water, thaw it out, it's all frozen in the lab, and test the river water for the environmental impact that it's having on the frogs. So literally sort of 
going from the lab to the field and then bringing the field back into the lab to have better control. The last little bit I'll tell you about before we talk about human stuff is work that I'm really excited about because it's ongoing work that we haven't published yet. We have this great, what I call lab fill lab model that I've told you about, but how do you really, if we go back, how do you really in this scenario test what kind of impact pesticides are having if the relationship is as complicated as I just told you about? And I didn't know how to do that, but what we ended up doing was running this backwards. Instead of bringing the field into the lab, we literally took the lab into the field. And, and here's what we did. It was, a, it was actually sort of an accident. This is California. The Salinas River runs this way. For those of you who don't know, starting about here is one of the largest agricultural areas in the United States, probably the world. 14% of the United States produce comes out of Salinas Valley. 85% of the United States lettuce come out of the Salinas Valley. And unlike Minnesota, we can farm year round in California. So it's intense, intense agriculture. And so I went out, this, this woman, Laura Meehan, wanted to actually do some work in, central, in Salinas Valley. And so we started driving up the river, literally just to see what frogs were there. Down here, the agriculture doesn't start to down here. We had really nice areas with, with what are called uh, red leg frogs. And, and this is nice. It was 22 degrees, the water's two feet deep, just a, a very peaceful place to be if you're a frog. If you go down here past the agriculture, it looks the same. So that's still the Salinas River, 22 degrees, knee deep, two feet of water, except that all of this water comes from agricultural runoff. In fact, this area is completely dry, so these two populations are cut off. The only difference is this one's upstream and this one's downstream of the agriculture. So all the pesticide runoff is, is, is in that water downstream. So we went to Santa Margarita, this is the upstream site, and Salinas, and the first question we asked is, does our laboratory, do our laboratory data predict things that we would see in the, in the real world. And if you look at developmental stage, so imagine this is gestational age, if you will. These animals are retarded. And again, they're only separated by about 50 miles. The difference is one comes before your food, and the other one is living in agriculture runoff from your food. Okay? If we look at size, just like we predict in the laboratory, they're retarded in their growth as well. But what's probably, what'll probably really help you see the differences is this. This is upstream, this is downstream. You can't see the little limbs developing there, but these animals are the same gestational age, if you will. They're the same developmental stage exactly, right? So this is like the equivalent in humans. This is like being small for gestational age, okay? Exact same stage. The only difference is this one's upstream of your food. This one's living in the water that runs off of your food. That's the only difference, same species. So then, what we really wanted to do, and here's what I mean by bringing the, the lab into the field, and this is uh, Laura Meehan and Young Kim Parker, is we wanted to test this immune function thing. So we'd, we'd shown that they were retarded in growth, retarded in development, but are they really suffering from immune dysfunction? And so what we did was we took cages, we took cages, and we put out cages, and we put one tadpole in each of those individual cages, upstream of the farms and downstream of the farms. And then, and then we came back and we injected these caged animals in their home. They were collected right in that same spot. We injected them with a deadly pathogen. We, we went to the grocery store and we bought bread yeast. Pretty benign. And when we injected bread yeast to animals from Santa Margarita, they were all alive the next day. And these are just different doses of yeast. But in, in Salinas, downstream of your food, these animals were paralyzed, these animals were morbid. These, what, 40% were dead. And at the higher dose, essentially they were all dead within hours. So you don't need a fancy chytrid fungus or some new frog virus. All you need is to put animals downstream of agriculture and they can't survive a bread yeast injection. And so again, if I'm an ecologist trying to figure out what's killing the frogs, I go, oh, there's a new disease called bread yeast. <laughs> but what's really happened is these animals have become so immunocompromised that they don't grow, they don't develop, and they can't fight off simple diseases, just like we've seen in the laboratory. Does anybody know what this is? A line, yeah, it's not a tree. It's not just a line, it is the line. This year, for the first time, I crossed the line. And I'm really gonna cross the line tonight. And I'll tell you what I mean. Um, I, th I think this will sum it up. This is my advisor, who I love, by the way. I'm not, I'm, this is not a slam at my advisor, but when I first got involved in this, he told me, don't be an advocate, let the science speak for itself. 
And again, that ivory tower thing, we're sort of taught that you know, we have to be objective, present your data, and, and that's it. That's what you do as a scientist. And I would give these talks, especially in Minnesota, and, and then afterward, people would say, well, Dr. Hayes, you gave half a talk. And I'd say, what do you mean? I said, well, you told us what the problem was, but you didn't tell us what to do. And I would always say, I'm not a regulator. It's not my position. It's my job to give you the data. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what to do now. Call your legislator. Go to the Capitol tomorrow and tell them, don't just regulate atrazine. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Here's why I decided to cross the line. Tim Pasteur Syngenta, when I first started speaking to Minnesota, spoke to Tom Mearsman in, in, in the newspaper here and wrote, or said, he's taking his information to people who don't have enough independent information to make a truly independent decision. He basically said, you guys are stupid, and I shouldn't be talking to you as an academic. And, and here's the other reason. Sherry Ford said during that same time that research that we have funded does not support the conclusions that Hayes is drawing from his own research. So the science isn't speaking for itself on the other side. So on the, other, on the one side, I'm trying to play by the, the ivory tower rules. And on the other side, people are playing by a different set of rules. And, 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 and so for those reasons, I decided to cross the line. Jim Carr, one of their scientists that they claim couldn't repeat our work, said, I don't think our data contradicts Hayes. My research speaks for itself. Again, he's being academic again. I am not responsible for how Syngenta chooses to characterize it. But the problem is when Syngenta goes to the public, goes to the media and makes statements that are not true, how then are you to make an informed decision as a member of the public if as scientists we're publishing in magazines that you can't buy in Barnes and Noble? And even when we speak, we refuse to give our expert opinion on, on such topics. The other reason I decided to cross the line is if you look at the data that they're talking about, it's, it's, I'll say it, I've been called unprofessional, but it's just a lie. So here's my hermaphrodite I showed you. Here's a hermaphrodite published by Syngenta. If you look at the graph, the red arrow showed the frequency, the percentage of hermaphrodites in their studies. They got more hermaphrodites than we did at, at, at some of the doses. And so the science, <laughs> the, sci <laughs> the science simply wasn't speaking for itself. The other part of the problem, the other thing that made me cross the line, somebody asked me about the EPA just before I came up here, and I said, that falls under the don't get me started category. <laughs> because the... And you can, they can call themselves EPA, Economic Protection Agency, Environmental Profit Agency, Environmental Protection Antagonist. They can still keep the acronym. But when you have situations like this, where the EPA is supposed to regulate Syngenta. I'm going to talk to you about the EPA in a minute. And you know, you're also welcome to, to tell me to shut up when you're ready. Syngenta has these advisory boards, scientific advisory boards, to help them figure out when there are problems. These advisory boards can hire study panels, like the one that I was on. These study panels can contract labs, like my lab was contracted by a study panel. They report back to the study panel. They can then publish in these scientific journals where there's peer review. The contract labs can publish directly. That goes back up to Syngenta. They report to the EPA. The EPA has a scientific advisory panel that tells it whether or not they're doing the right thing. They even have an endocrine disruptor screening and testing committee that tells the advisory panel to tell the EPA what to tell the company. So with all those checks and balances, why do I have to come here and tell you about atrazine? Should be regulated up to, you know what? Well, part of the problem is there's a guy named Ron Kendall who's advising Syngenta. He also was on the EPA's EdStack board. He also chaired the scientific advisory panel. I'm not making this up. He was over the study panel that I was on. He runs the contract lab where that work was done, and he's the editor of the scientific journal that they published in. To make matters worse, their laboratory produced the current vice president of Syngenta, a guy named... Uh, Verna Kloos, who was on the EPA scientific advisory panel, got a million dollar contract one week after they re-registered atrazine. And there's even a guy from Syngenta who works in an EPA laboratory and publishes but never acknowledges that he's paid for by Syngenta. I decided somebody had to cross the line. I'm not making this up. You can look up this guy's resume on, on the web and see that I'm telling you the truth about all of his, all of his uh, connections. The other reason I decided to cross the line really happened a few months ago. And I'll show you the rest of the quote later. Paper a newspaper article came out where Stephen Bradbury, the US EPA, when discussing my work, said, because now they can't claim that it's not repeatable. They know that the science is there. He said, the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. And, 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 and that made me cross the line. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why. My talk is entitled From Silent Spring to Silent Night. Silent Spring being, of course, Rachel Carson's book where she wrote about the pesticide effects on birds 
for demonstrating a pending, effect, pending effects on human health. And I firmly believe that in the same way that she feared, that we feared, that our silent spring was indicative of problems with humans, I fear that our silent night and our declining amphibians are telling us something about humans as well. I think the irony is when you go to places like Uganda's Lake Nabugabu, where I work, and if you told those men that this runoff, this pond, which is all running off of their crop, which goes into these canisters and is their sole source of drinking, bathing, and cooking water, if I told these guys, you know, the frogs in this water have eggs in their testes and, and you know, that, that can have, you know, and they, and they don't make sperm. I'm sure these men would see the connection between environmental health and public health because they're taking the water right as it runs off of their crop. The problem is, and I always joke, this is my village. That's a little bigger. That's what the Oakland A's and the Raiders play. And, and I live, well, let me show you where I live. If Syngenta's here, don't look. I don't want you coming to my house. But I live right, I live right back here. And, and my water just comes from here. It's not all that different. When you consider that a half million pounds of rain, a half million pounds of atrazine are coming down in concentrations capable of chemically castrating frogs every year, I just don't make the connection because my water comes out of a faucet and I have this EPA, whatever it stands for, that I think is keeping my water safe. So I, I've lost that connection. I want to show you just a little piece of that connection. This is a quote from Glenn Frox, who wrote, in echoepidemiology, so the study of disease in wildlife, is the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. In other words, he's saying, if I showed this effect of atrazine in one frog, maybe it's not a big deal. But if I showed it in multiple species, it can't be a coincidence that there's a cause and effect relationship. I don't have time to tell you about it, but these mechanisms I've told you about have been shown in fish, birds, and reptiles. And what I am going to tell you is about a few of the papers, a few of the 40 papers that have shown the same effects in mammals, including human tissues and cells. In fact, we just published a paper. The EPA testified before your legislature two years ago and said that I was making it up. They said there's no direct scientific information to assess this hypothesis. I'm going to show you the work is published. You can go look it up. And I have a website now where you can easily look it up. I'm going to first show you that testosterone is decreased by atrazine, leading to a decrease in sperm production in mammals, just like we see in amphibians. In rats, this is a study done in Europe, so it's not my work. Atrazine-exposed rats suffer a decrease in testosterone and a decline in sperm. Again, red means bad. In humans, Shauna Swan showed the following. These are men in Missouri. Men in Missouri, when exposed to atrazine, have experienced subfertility, low sperm count, and they can't get their wives pregnant. And I don't know what it means, but the level of atrazine in their urine, these men who report the subfertility, is higher than the men who don't have sexual problems. And this level in their urine, 0.1 parts per billion, is the same thing it takes to chemically castrate a frog. Now, to, 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 to really bring this home, watch the y-axis. I, I spent a lot of time uh, playing with PowerPoint. Because I'm changing the y-axis, but the data's still there. The axis now goes up to 240 instead of 0.18. Because Lucas et al. showed that here are atrazine levels in field workers, and now watch the axis again. Here are atrazine levels in men who apply atrazine. These men have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine that we know leads to subfertility in men who live in Missouri in agricultural areas. Or let me put it to you this way. These men have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine that it takes to chemically castrate and make a hermaphroditic frog. One of these men could pee in a bucket. I could dilute it 24,000 times, and I could use this dilute urine to chemically castrate and make hermaphrodites out of 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. But nobody knows anything about the health care of these men because they're primarily Mexican migrant workers and nobody follows their health care. These men also can't use bottled water and filtered water because that atrazine is from inhalation and from across the skin. The other half of the equation is, does atrazine really cause an increase in estrogen and these estrogen-regulated effects? I'm going to focus on mammary tumors, on breast cancer. In Rats, in laboratory rats, and this study was actually done in the EPA laboratory where the Syngenta guy works, there's a decline in testosterone and there's an increase in estrogen. Okay, so just like we see in our frogs. In these same, in, a, in another study done by Syngenta, estrogen goes up in these rats and they suffer from an increase in breast cancer incidence because breast cancer is estrogen dependent. In humans, 
in cell lines, and we just published two papers just this month. If you expose human cells, cancer cells to atrazine, they make the enzyme that makes estrogen, and they make estrogen in cell culture. Same thing we see in the frogs, same thing they've seen in fish, same thing they've seen in rats. And finally, in a study by Kettles et al., with a p-value of 0. 0.0001, women whose well waters contaminate with atrazine were more likely to develop breast cancer than women who live in the same community but don't drink that well water. Now, I don't know if you're into p-values, but this means there's only a 0.01% chance that this is random. One one-hundredth of a penny out of a dollar that this effect is random. Prostate cancer is also estrogen dependent, and in one of their factories, they show that there's an 8.4-fold increase in prostate cancer in men who work in their factory in Louisiana and San Gabriel, primarily African-American men who are already four times more likely to die from prostate cancer. So it's not just a frog issue, and it's not just multiple species of frogs. Every class of vertebrate has shown this effect, which the EPA says doesn't exist. It's all published. And EPA ain't like my mom. They don't have to go to Barnes & Noble. They can get access to these peer-reviewed journals. You can now, too. I have a website where you can get it that I'm, going to, that I'm going to show you. What I'm really excited about now is we've taken these studies in frogs. And I want you to understand this. We can't do experiments on humans. We can't expose humans experimentally and look at what happens to them when they grow up. But I can do it with frogs. I can do three or four generations in a year and ask, what are the cross-generational effects? because I can breed frogs to do that. And they might be more sensitive, but we know that the genes, the aromatase gene that I've been talking about that converts testosterone to estrogen, the sequence and its regulation is exactly the same as you see in humans. But we don't have the cell lines in frogs, so we can take this aquatic organism and do experiments, but then we can take cell lines from this aquatic organism and understand the molecular mechanisms. The problem is, even once you get all that science out, the regulatory agency, says there is no direct scientific information, even though it's published. In fact, it's published in the National Institutes of Health Journal. We just had two papers come out on this issue. As I, and I, and I, as I approach the end, I, I want to cover two more things, okay? because I really want you to think about the legislation that's coming up. One is the industry and the people that they fund are going to tell you that rat studies don't tell us anything about humans. They just said this on a radio show I was on that rat studies don't tell you anything about humans. I want you to understand the following. These two rats, this is a published data now. This is a control, and this is a rat treat. You guys ever hear of DES? Okay, this is a rat exposed to DES, or mouse. They have the same caloric intake, the same exercise and everything, but the rat that's exposed to DES becomes obese. Everything else is controlled, okay? And there's a reason I'm giving you this analogy. So, first point is that one part per billion DES induces obesity. On the other hand, a high dose of DES actually causes weight loss. You'll see what my points are in a minute. If you take this DES-exposed mouse and allow it to reproduce, it will produce female offspring that have vaginal cancers and uterine deformities. Okay? For those that are able to reproduce, when they grow up, they still have the vaginal cancers and uterine deformities, but the offspring, their granddaughters of the exposed mice, will still develop these vaginal cancers and uterine deformities. Okay? Here are the points that I want you to take home. The effects are transferred to the granddaughters. Here's why it's relevant to my talk. One is I want you to know that low doses matter. 0.1 parts per billion might sound like a low dose to somebody who studies toxicity, but it's a high dose for somebody who studies hormones. Your hormones work at 100 to 1,000 times lower than that number. So low doses matter. The second point is that high doses do not predict the low dose effects. In this case, the low dose caused you to get obese. High doses cause you to lose weight. The third point is that one compound can have many effects. This effect on obesity has nothing to do with why they develop the cancers. It's operating through two different modes of action. The fourth point is that early exposure is important and effects can cross generations. So trying to study atrazine in the water and breast cancer in adults might not tell you anything. If I studied DES exposure in this adult female rat, it wouldn't tell me anything because it was her mother that was exposed. If I tried to study DES and vaginal cancers in this granddaughter, it wouldn't tell me anything because it was her grandmother that was exposed. The fifth point is that these effects in rodents predict effects in humans. DES causes the same uterine malformations, and same vaginal cancers in humans. 
People my age were the daughters of the people exposed to DES, and now they're giving birth to granddaughters of the DES mothers that have these same deformities. So we had to wait two generations to figure out in humans, but we banned it because we figured it out in mice first. So that's my point. Lab rats are relevant. With that in mind, I want to tell you about some stuff I didn't have time to tell you about. Rats exposed to atrazine develop prostate and mammary cancer, which I did talk about. Atrazine also induces immune failure, which I talked a little bit about when these animals are exposed as adults. When they're exposed developmentally, they develop neural damage. They fidget and they can't learn as well. It's published work. It's not my work, but it's published. And at the same time, atrazine induces abortion in some strains of rats. Of those that can reproduce, the babies of the atrazine-exposed mothers, the males develop prostate disease that was done in an EPA laboratory, and the females suffer from impaired mammary development, and I'll show you what that looks like. This was also done in a National Institute of Health laboratory. So here's the breasts, developing breasts. All these ducks are what should make milk. Here's what happens if the mother was exposed to atrazine. Not while she was carrying the baby, but what's more is when these rats with impaired mammary development grow up, they can't feed their babies properly, and they suffer from impaired growth and development. Here's why I'm showing you this. We already know from DES, we've already played that game. What's the expression, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me? We've already played that game. We've already waited two generations to see that rats exposed to DES were telling us something already. Now think about the game we're playing with atrazine. I want you to think about this when you make a decision about whether or not to call your legislator tomorrow. In France, they've shown that even when they stop using atrazine, 20 years later, it's still in the water. So this issue is not about me and you. We've already been exposed. It's not about our kids. Our kids have already been exposed. And if we follow this rat model, our grandkids would be exposed, knowing what we know about how long atrazine will stay in the environment. If we ban atrazine tomorrow, our grandchildren will be exposed. And if we follow this rat model, our exposed grandchildren will have grandchildren themselves that are still suffering the effects of atrazine, even if they aren't exposed. It's not about me and you, or our kids, or our grandkids. It's a decision that will affect our grandchildren's grandchildren. That's why I crossed the line. The other reason I crossed the line is you're going to hear from industry that cell lines don't matter. It's unrealistic that if you expose a cell to atrazine, it's unrealistic as to what it will do to people. That's what they're going to tell you. But how do you think we discover our anti-cancer drugs? We don't inject them into people. We use cell lines. Let me show you an example. Breast cancer happens when a cell gets damaged. And once that cell's damaged, we know, I'm going to tell you how we know this. We know that aromatase turns on estrogen, which causes those cells to become a cancer. And even if you believe the EPA, even if you refuse to believe any of the papers that I'm telling you already published, consider the following. If you get breast cancer right now, which is the number one cancer in women, and now cancer the number one cause of death, you will likely be given a compound called letrozole that reduces aromatase, reduces estrogen, and will stop your cancer from growing. Companies have spent millions of dollars to develop a drug that they're going to tell you works a thousand times better than any other drug for breast and prostate cancer. That was developed in a cell line. And the same time that they're going to sell you an aromatase blocker to treat your breast cancer, another company's selling you a pesticide that does exactly the opposite, and they're telling you that that doesn't matter. Here's what I want you to know. It's not another company. On one website, Novartis will tell you that atrazine induction of aromatase does not have an impact on breast cancer. On their pharmaceutical website, they will tell you that they have developed a drug that's a thousand times more potent at blocking breast cancer that knocks out aromatase. Both can't be true. As we used to say back when I was growing up, somebody's getting PAD on both sides of the issue. That's why I decided to cross the line. Because the EPA will tell you that there is no direct scientific information. Part of the problem is the EPA is being told by groups like the Center for Regulatory Effectiveness that they can't use primary data. So with regards to atrazine, here's why you have to go to the Capitol. And I never thought I'd say things like, call your, call your representative. Here's why you have to. Here's what the EPA is going to do for atrazine. They have a three-tier model. You can look this up on their website. They're requiring the company to test the apical effects, so to do the lab work. And if they get a no, they're not even going to look at it for regulation again. 
So if the company screws up the experiment and can't get a repeat, that's the end of anthracene being regulated by the EPA. Even if they get a yes, then what the company has to do is go out and do the field studies that I've already done. They were given six years to do this work. It takes three of my undergraduates three months to do it, so they're going to be given a lot of long time to do that. And then even if they get ecological relevance, they're being challenged to get the whole mechanism understood before they would even talk about regulating atrazine. That's 40 years of work. And when you consider that even after those 40 years, our grandchildren's our grandchildren will still be affected, and our grandchildren's grandchildren, potentially. Now, people say, I just don't like atrazine. So what if we took this model? What if we had this model back in 1973? DDT would have had another seven years on the market because we didn't have the apical lab studies for DT, DDT until 1980. Like this for to test the hypothesis that speeding cars kill children. We'd, we'd first have to put them in a parking lot and do an experiment. And then even if we showed that the speeding cars kill kids, We'd have to do the field work, so we'd put some children on the highway and see if they get killed. You know, maybe a thousand, that's a good sample size. And then, even if we got a yes there, we'd have to understand the mechanism first. Were they crushed by the front tires? If not, then we'd have to test crushed by the back tires or hit by the bumper. It's we're laughing, but it's ridiculous. That is what the EPA has decided for how they're going to assess chemicals that are already in the environment. That is not an environmental protective policy. An environmental protective policy is you get rid of the problem. That's why I decided to cross the line, and that's why I'm encouraging you to go to the Capitol to write to your representative, because it's voters being there and expressing their opinion that count. As the EPA says, the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. The rest of their quote was, it weighs in public opinion. And that's why I crossed the line, to make sure that you have the information, because they're counting on you. You shouldn't be counting on them. If you want the actual papers, I actually have a website, <laughs> atrazinelovers.com. It's, it's real. You can go through there and get summaries of everything I talked about and couldn't talk about, and then you can actually click on the actual scientific papers so that you can read and interpret for yourself, or you can email me directly, and, and, and I will let you know whatever you want to know. So I've actually gone 15 minutes over my time, but before I close to accommodate those who might have a question or two, I like to take a minute to spit a rhyme in it, because where I come from, that's how we do. So let me remind you, don't put this behind you, atrazine ain't a good thing. It causes male frogs to grow eggs, contributes to extra legs, and exposed males don't want to sing. And now if that ain't enough, when you combine this stuff with a few other pesticides, it causes greater than additive effects, unpredictable defects, and to use the technical term, they's all messed up inside. Exposed larvae don't grow, and they develop slow, and they contract diseases that otherwise could be beaten. You see, you see this? <laughs> This exposure affects their composure and determines who's going to eat and who's going to be eaten. And now when we tested this scenario at Santa Margarita, when those frogs were injected, they weren't affected, but that's the result we expected to get. But they got sick and died at Salinas, but let's keep that between us because I ain't published that yet. And <laughs> when I do, how will it affect you? You may never know, because if the EPA has their way, it might take 40 years or more. And while I'm on the EPA, I got to replay this and ask, how can they say this? When this effect occurs at levels that they're barely capable of detecting, well, they're an agency for sure, but the way they keep avoiding the cure, I'm starting to wonder exactly what it is they're protecting. So if you're sitting there thinking that the water you're drinking is fine, well, that ain't the case. Because you see, this endocrine disruption that leads to biological corruption is relative to all species including the human race. So, so what, you might say, who cares anyway? If somehow you still don't see the connection to you, I'm here to remind you that your son or daughter will develop in water just like my tadpoles do. And so as we approach the hour, I want to remind you that you've got the power and that a whole world, not just Minnesota, a whole world is waiting on your stance. You see, I think we have a lot of the problem solved, but if we want to fix it, we have to get politically involved. The future it's in your hands. Thank you. I, I, I think from what I saw two years ago at the atrazine hearings, what I saw was Syngenta able to bring in busloads of people and, and do what you guys just did. And I think if you feel a certain way and you can do the same thing, I've, it will make a huge, huge difference. 
And the other thing I want to say, I've been called an activist. I'm not an act. In fact, I used to try to distance myself from those crazy activist people. I have worked with the company with an open mind. I have worked with the EPA with an open mind. And the only thing that's going to make a difference now are the people in this room. And, and again, it's not for us. It's our grandchildren's grandchildren we're talking about. Anyway, I'll shut up. Are there questions? Yes. I'm testifying tomorrow, correct? Yes. Um, you know, again, I only crossed the line recently, and I've, I've been campaigning very... See, part of the problem is what came up with in Minnesota was if we ban it and everybody else is at an economic disadvantage, or at an economic advantage. Some of the things I didn't have time to go into, because I already went over my time, is atrazine, at best, increases corn yield by 1.2%. Okay, I'm going to get to your state thing. I want to point a couple things out. Other studies have shown that there's no difference between atrazine and non-atrazine in weed control and corn production. So we're, at best, we're talking about putting a price on breast and prostate and our granddaughters' granddaughters for a 1.2% increase. And it has nothing to do with feeding the world. We only eat 2% of the corn that we grow, and 20% of the world will die of starvation. It has nothing to do with feeding the world. It has to do with money. So different states are handling it differently. It means different things in different states. I've been campaigning pretty heavily to try to get a block with Washington, California, and Oregon because we're not really a corn-growing state, but we grow enough that it'll matter. And I really think all you have to do is get one or two states. That's how DDT was banned. That's how Tributal 10 was banned. One or two states banned it, and then Congress said, oh, we can't have things regulated differently. EPA didn't ban those compounds, by the way. Congress did. Okay? For Tributal 10... The EPA fought to keep it on the market, and Ronald Reagan signed it into, into law. So it takes one or two states, and actually I'll tell you, I don't want to brag, but I've had a meeting with Al Gore, and I'll tell you, if one or two states will just have a hearing, then it will come up in the U.S. Congress. And of course, you know, Keith Ellison's there now to help push it. But So individual states, and I, as I said, I've only now crossed the line, but I've been working with California, Oregon, Washington, and a lot with Minnesota, and if I have anything to do with it, it'll come up in every place that I can get it to.